Hello, good evening. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Stephanie LaRue. I am the Associate Director at CSREA, the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America. CSREA is an interdisciplinary hub that aims to build community with the public and among scholars and students working on race and ethnicity in America. We at the Center are very excited to continue our collaboration with the School of Public Health in what marks the third event in a four-part series on race and health equity. We invite you to attend the concluding event of the Building Health Equity in an Unequal World Series, the World Series, right? Uh, which will be an expert roundtable discussion on Thursday, April 12th, from 1 to 3 p.m. at the School of Public Health. You can find more information about the series on the School of Public Health and the CSREA's websites. Today's lecture is sponsored by the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America and the School of Public Health, with additional co-sponsorship support from the Office of the President, the Warren Alpert Medical School Office of Diversity and Multicultural Affairs, and the Office of Institutional Equity and Diversity. We'd also like to recognize the efforts of Dr. Ron Aubert, who helped organize this event. After the lecture and discussion, we hope that you will join us for refreshments in the lobby. And at this time, I'd like to invite Bess Marcus, Dean of the School of Public Health, to the podium to make a few opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I also want to thank the study for, um, for the CSREA for their collaboration in this really exciting, important series. I think it really is the World Series, and, and four, um, four sessions is just the beginning um, of all the work we have to do together. And it's great to have all of you here um, to hopefully get inspired about with ideas of what we can do here in Rhode Island um, with the wonderful example that our speaker will be sharing with us. So tonight's focus is on environmental racism and social justice. And um, in, environmental racism has really put communities of color at a disadvantage. And, and as our speaker is going to tell us you know, about Flint, and Flint unfortunately is just one example of so many places um, where we have situations like this or we're about to, um, whether we know it or not. And that's the huge work we all have to do together. So, um, really, you know, what happened in Flint is tragic. And, and what's tragic is that, again, as I said, um, it's not the only city where uh, residents are exposed to poisonous elements that will have lifelong effects on them. And they may know that, but they most likely don't know that. So the truth is that lead poisoning is too common for poor American families everywhere, including here in Rhode Island. In fact, 80% of homes in Rhode Island contain lead-based paint, the most common source of lead exposure for children in our state. And these homes also face, um, and these families face, concerns with lead water pipes. And addressing these dangers for children in, in the homes where they sleep, they learn, they play, is, is just significant and important. And it's something we all are working on um, in, in our institutions here and have a lot more work to do. One of the things um, about thinking about environmental racism is that it's the cities where the poverty level is the highest where the exposure is the greatest. Um, and so in Rhode Island cities where we have um, higher poverty level, there's a 15% higher incidence of lead poisoning. Um, actually, there, it's three times higher than elsewhere in the state. So Central Falls, Pawtucket, Providence, and Woonsocket are disproportionately affected. So just like Flint, um, lead poisoning continues to disproportionately affect um, those from socioeconomic disadvantage and, and those um, of color. So I urge all of you here, it's great to see all of you here, to really listen and think about what you can do to inspire your own activism um, to, to make a difference here and in all the communities that, that you live in. And at this point, I'd like to ask Dr. Carolyn Kuo, who is our Assistant Dean for Diversity and Inclusion in the School of Public Health, to come forward for some remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Marcus, and it's great to see all of you here. So you'll notice that we symbolically scheduled this talk for March 1st, 
and Black History Month was last month, but we purposely did that because we want to call on all of us to persist, to not let up on our public health efforts and other efforts to address health disparities that are generated by historical legacies of racial discrimination. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to recognize a few people in the room who I will ask to stand. First, I wish to thank my colleagues at the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America, Dr. Tricia Rose, Dr. Stephanie LaRue, Caitlin Scott, and Christina Downs. <laughs> I also want to thank our team at the School of Public Health, in particular, Joel Hernandez, Karen Scanlon, Laura Joyce, <laughs> and the members of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee who've worked incredibly hard to bring this event to you. I also want to recognize our amazing media services team who will be videotaping this event for those of you later. And last but not least, I want to thank Ashley Lovett. She is sitting right up here. She's an exceptional doctoral student at the School of Public Health. She's an alum of Michigan State University, a native in Michigan, who first introduced the idea of bringing Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha to Brown. And after we hear from Dr. Hanna Atisha, Ashley will be kicking off the Q&A from the audience. I now have the honor of introducing Dr. Hanna Atisha. Dr. Hanna Atisha directs the Michigan State University and Hurley Children's Hospital Public Health Initiative. This is an innovative public health model that re conducts research, monitors, and mitigates the impact of lead in the Flint community. We're gonna hear much more about that tonight. She has deep ties to the Michigan community. She trained as a medical student in Michigan State University's College of Human Medicine. She com completed her residency there and her chief residency at the Children's Hospital of Michigan. And she also has a master's degree in public health from the University of Michigan School of Public Health. So at this time, let's welcome her. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. It is great to be here. Um, so when I was in high school, I was infatuated with Brown. And I, I don't know why. I only really largely to Michigan. And I really wanted to come here for college. Um, and I applied. And I even had like a second interview like with an alumni close to home. But I didn't get in. Um, so it is great. But then I interviewed here for residency at Hasbro Children's Hospital. But the match is a crazy process. And I wanted to stay close to Michigan. So it is great to be here um, in this capacity. Uh, maybe my kids will come here or something. Uh, so thanks for having me. Um, so just kind of for more my benefit to get a kind of a sense of who's here. So do we have students of any kind like public health or med students or undergrad students? We're all lifelong students too. Okay, great PhD students. Um, faculty, like public health faculty or other faculty. Uh, people who work in government or some agency people, government people, awesome. Uh, community members. Great, everybody's a community member. Great, all community members, great. Uh, awesome, so great. Uh, it's great to see this really diverse group of folks uh, here at the table. Uh, so I am going to start uh, by talking about a kid. Uh, so I am a pediatrician, so I have the, the best job in the world. I get to take care of kids uh, almost every single day. Um, and this is a little girl that I saw earlier this week um, in clinic. This is Lily. Uh, she was coming in for her four-year checkup. Um, she's like one of those kids you ask her, like, you know, we have pediatricians have a bunch of like pocket questions. I'm like, how old are you? And she shouts her age. She's like, I am four. Uh, I'm like, okay, give me a high five. Um, and almost as if every year is an achievement. Um, and in some respects, in Flint, every year is achievement. Um, we have so many issues. Um, even before our water crisis. Um, Flint has been in crisis uh, for decades prior to the water crisis. Um, Flint has suffered from disinvestment, unemployment, poverty. Uh, we have a 60% poverty rate for our children. Uh, racism, both institutional, structural, uh, ongoing racism, population loss. We have lost half of our population um, because of the loss of manufacturing. Uh, violent crime. Uh, we are one of, the, one of the most violent crime rates in the country. The military special ops medics like the Army Rangers, Navy SEALs. Flint is one of their training sites because it's essentially a war zone on our streets. Before the water crisis, I was mentioning earlier that I actually was taking care of kids with lead poisoning because of retained bullets um, from, from being shot. 
um, crumbling schools. I mean, every disparity you can think of um, we have in Flint, which is kind of what, what drew me to that city uh, and, and has kept me there. Um, but this all takes a toll. This all adds up. This all leads to you know, disparate health outcomes. And, and it literally drops life expectancy. So a child in Flint has a 15 year less life expectancy, one five, than a child in a neighboring zip code, 15 years. So Flint is one of those places where the where where you are born, the zip code where you are born in, really portends um, your life outcomes um, forever. So Flint is, is definitely one of those places where our, our inequality problems, um, our injustice problems are, are most striking. So getting back to Lily. So one of the favorite questions we also like to ask as pediatricians is what do you want to be when you grow up? So remember, this is her, her four year checkup. I'm like, Lily, what do you want to be when you grow up? She's like, I want to be five. I'm like, awesome. So give her a fist bump. Um, so I examined her and, and she was fine. She took that stethoscope and she tried to listen to her knees. Uh, didn't really work out. Um, but her, you know, her eyes wide open to just a world of, of opportunity. And her physical exam was fine. Um, and then her mom turned to me with, with an all too familiar look. Um, and she asked me, um, is she gonna be okay? And I think I get asked this question every single day in Flint. Is she going to be okay? And that mom had that mom look of fear, anxiety, guilt. Is she gonna be okay? So, so what, do, what do I tell her mom? Um, you know, they thought the water was fine. They were told. Uh, the water was fine that they were drinking. Uh, how could water that comes out of our tap not be fine? We are literally in the middle of the Great Lakes. It is America. It is the 21st century. There are people and laws, right, to make sure that when we turn on our tap, our water is safe. This is, this is not uh, John Snow and cholera days, which hopefully you're learning about in epidemiology. This is, this is the 21st century America. When you, you turn on your water, it, it's supposed to be OK, right? Um, so, so what do I tell, um, what do I tell Lily's mom when she asks me, um, is she going to be okay? Uh, do I tell her about the science of lead, um, that we now know that it's a potent, irreversible neurotoxin? Um, do I tell her that we now know that there is no safe level of lead? Uh, do I tell her um, what it does to cognition and behavior, how it, it literally erodes IQ levels and twists behavior, and, and it, it just impacts the fundamental being of who you are, how you think, and how you act? Um, do I tell her um, that every agency that was supposed to protect her daughter to keep her safe, um, to keep her protective, failed, um, and literally looked the other way. Uh, do I tell Lily's mom that she was poisoned um, by policy? So what happened in Flint is probably the most important environmental and public health disaster of this young century. Um, but what I want to share with you is that the Flint story, um, is, it goes beyond Flint. It is, it is more than Flint. Um, like Dean mentioned, um, there are Flints everywhere, um, from the Rust Belt to rural America to the coast to beyond. There are kids everywhere, black, brown, white, that are waking up literally to that, to that same nightmare um, of injustice, of poverty, um, of lost democracy. Flint is, um, is also a story about the deeper crises that we are facing um, in our nation that, that break down in democracy. The disintegration of critical infrastructure. You should come to Michigan right now. We have um, people post all the potholes, like our roads are falling apart, and what's underground is probably even worse. Um, issues of environmental injustice, which we'll talk about. We are at a point in our nation where we see a disrespect for science. Um, the abandonment of civic responsibility, that, that deep obligation of, of our role as human beings to care and, and to provide for each other. And if we stop believing that, that government can protect our public welfare and protect kids like Lily, not, not just the privileged ones, but all our kids, um, what, do we, what do we have left? Uh, who are, are we as a, as a people, as a society, um, as a civilization? So um, getting back to Flint. So uh, hopefully you guys all have heard about the Flint water crisis and you've seen pictures like this. 
Um, and when you probably first saw this, you're like, this can't be real. This has got to be Photoshop. This is probably fake news, right? Like somebody probably put like iced tea or, or soda and, and ran it through. I mean, how can this be? So, so how did this happen? So I mentioned kind of this dire state that the city of Flinton was in, this decades of crisis. And that led, led to a city that was almost bankrupt. And in Michigan, if you're almost bankrupt as a city, um, you can be, uh, become under state control. So in 2011, Flint literally lost democracy and we were under control of a state appointed emergency manager. And that emergency manager's job was one thing, it was austerity to save money. No matter what the cost, their job was, was to save money and to balance the books. No regard for public health, no regard for children's health, nothing. Let's see how we can save money. And it was decided that the water that we had been getting from Detroit, which was fresh Great Lakes water, for a half a century, pre-treated, fresh Great Lakes water was too expensive. Um, and that we would start getting water from the local Flint River until a new pipeline was to be built um, to the Great Lakes. Um, so in April of 2014, by a very simple flip of a switch um, by our mayor, um, we started drawing water from the local Flint River. And people complained. They, they raised their voices. The people of Flint have been heroic in this story. Um, they said, my water looks gross. It smells gross. It tastes gross. We had high levels of bacteria in the water. We had three boil advisories, which is like the worst thing you're supposed to do when there's lead in the water. Um, then they dumped a lot of chlorine in the water to kill that bacteria. And the people felt that they were drinking and bathing in bleach, and that irritated people's skin and eyes. And then for nine months, we had safe drinking water violations because of a buildup of a chlorine byproduct, something called total trihalomethanes, which is a mouthful, but it's also a carcinogen. Um, so there there was issues with this water um, from the start. And it turned out that when they switched to the Flint River, um, they forgot to add an important ingredient, uh, something called corrosion control. It's federally mandated. It is a necessary ingredient in water treatment. And its purpose is to prevent whatever the metal is in the pipes from coming out and going into the drinking water. Um, so this corrosion control was, was not added to the Flint water. The pump to install the corrosion control was not even installed. Um, even when the EPA found out that the state wasn't adding this corrosion control, they said, we're still not going to add this corrosion control. Um, and it turned out, without this corrosion control, that the Flint River water, the tap water, was 19 times more corrosive than our previous water from Detroit. It was 19 times more corrosive. The color was because of iron pipe corrosion. So it was the rust colored water was from the iron pipes corroding. Um, the lead in water is clear, it's invisible. Nobody can see lead in water. Um, so this really corrosive water went through our water distribution system. Um, and Flint, like many older cities in the Northeast and Midwest, um, has a lot of lead in their plumbing. Uh, we were stubbornly slow as a nation to get rid of lead from our plumbing, just like we were stubbornly slow to get, lead, get rid of lead in every source, uh, well behind most countries. So not until 1986 did we actually restrict the use of lead service lines, which are those pipes that come from the water main to your house. Um, and then um, not until 2014 did we restrict the use of lead in brass fixtures, which is just shocking. Um, so a great example is our Flint schools. Um, big buildings don't usually have big lead pipes, uh, but our Flint schools had some of the highest water lead levels, like in the thousands of parts per billion. Um, but they didn't have any lead pipes, but it was their internal fixtures and their solder um, that, that were leaching uh, the lead out. Um, so like I said, the, the people of Flint were raising their voices. They were literally going to town hall meetings with jugs of brown water and getting arrested. Uh, nobody was listening to them. They were being ridiculed, dismissed, and ignored. Um, and at the same time, about six months after we switched to this water source, uh, General Motors, which, which was born in Flint, which I'm going to talk about, they have, they have plants in Flint. They build cars there. Um, they got a bypass um, because this water was corroding their engine parts. So this water was corroding engine parts, but the people of Flint were literally told to relax. 
that everything is okay. I mean, it's, 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 it's still to this day mind boggling. Um, Jesse Jackson uh, came to Flint. He called Flint a crime scene. Uh, Michael Moore said the water crisis was not a mistake. He said it was a racial crisis that would not have happened in a whiter or a richer city. Um, and for those of us who do public health, who take care of kids, who know lead, um, it's, it's a call to action. You know, we know that it's already an environmental injustice. We know that it's an, a form of environmental racism. We know that it already burdens our, our most vulnerable children. Our kids in Flint already had higher rates of lead than kids outside of Flint because of being a legacy city, high rates of poverty, lead, chip, lead in paint, lead in soil, industrial lead. Um, and just like kids all over the country who are vulnerable, kids in Detroit and Chicago and Baltimore, and kids in, in Providence as well. So it already, like we heard, disproportionately impacts the most vulnerable children. It is a form of environmental racism, and it is entirely preventable. So it is a social and, envir and environmental injustice, and, and in Flint, that, that injustice only widened. Um, so it's also so hard to believe that this happened in Michigan. So I know I have one Michigander here. Any other Michiganders in the audience? Oh my God, there's a lot of Michiganders, awesome. So those of us from Michigan, how do we share like where we're from? The hand, the mitten, oh my God, he did it. Where are you from? from You're from Detroit, awesome. Flint. Flint, from Flint, that's awesome. So, um, so we kind of, we point to that city. So here's Detroit, here's Flint, here's Ann Arbor, here's Traverse City, and we actually have an Upper Peninsula, but we forget about it because that's too complicated. <laughs> so, so Flint is the Mitten State, and or Michigan is the Mitten State, and, and why are we the Mitten State? What are we surrounded by? Water. So we are surrounded by the Great Lakes, okay? Do you guys know that the Great Lakes is the largest source of fresh water in the world, in the world? 20% of the fresh water in the world is around Michigan, and here's Flint. Pretty much smack dab in the middle of the largest source of fresh water in the world, and to this day, we are on filtered and bottled water to this day. And this, it can't be lost that this story also happened in Flint. Um, like my Flint natives know, um, Flint from its beginnings has been a place of extremes where greed meets solidarity, where bigotry has met fairness, where the struggle for equality has played out. Flint is a place where many people have been pushed down and have risen, um, and when, where many, many people have fought the good fight and won. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you back to a little bit of a history lesson. So what, what is Flint famous for? And my Flint person can't say anything. Uh, before the water crisis, what, what was Flint famous for? Like decades ago. I heard it, cars, cars, so cars. So cars were born in Flint. General Motors was born in Flint. So over a century ago, Flint birthed cars. Um, but more importantly than the birth of cars, um, and as a consequence of manufacturing, does, you get extra credit if you know this, what, what else was Flint famous for? My Flint person can respond if they know. So Flint was, is known for really being the birthplace of opportunity, um, the birthplace of the middle class, um, the birthplace of, of, of labor uh, and unions, and, and I'll get to that. So in, in, in 1936, um, auto workers in many GM plants said, we have a, we've had enough. Um, they s literally sat down and took over a series of car plants in Flint. And they said, we're not working, we are striking. And this was called the great sit down strike. And for 44 days, they demanded better wages. They demanded occupational safety, like, hey, we don't wanna get our fingers cut off anymore. Uh, they demanded better working conditions. Um, and it was, these, it was a radical, illegal act of disobedience. Um, the, the GM tried to beat them up. They tried to cut the heat on them. Um, they tried to freeze them out. This was in like this December, January, cold Michigan winter. And even our Flint kids uh, were part of the fight. So this, these are 80 year olds now, but these are our ever resilient Flint kids um, who raised their voices. And look at this, this is great, there's a sign, uh, better, better food, fighting for better food, a better life. Um, 
And it took the personal intervention at that time of the governor of Michigan, this really great progressive governor named Governor Murphy, and President Roosevelt to end the strike. And something radical happened. Um, Labor won. Their union, which was the UAW, was recognized. And it was the first time that working people had access to the American dream, to American opportunity, um, to a good life, to middle class wages, to a pension, to great schools, to better working conditions. At one point, Flint had the highest per capita incomes in the country. Can you believe that? Flint, people in Flint made the most money in the whole country and thus had some of the best public health indices. So this, this is, you know, you got to understand that labor and economics, everything is related to public health. Um, this is all part of our story. Um, and what happened in Flint informed wages across the country for decades. Um, and just like many of our civil rights struggles, it took radical acts of disobedience, illegal acts, um, to create change, to create betterment, to create a better life um, for people. Um, so back at Flint uh, recently, um, kind of inspired by the history of, of resilience and grit, grit in Flint, um, we did the same thing. We, we resisted. Um, when I heard about the possibility of, of lead in the water, like I said, any pediatrician, anybody in public health, you kind of freak out uh, when, you, when you know what lead does. Um, and I, 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 I thought about Lily. I thought about Lily and the thousands of other kids um, just like her who are already struggling with every adversity in the world. Um, as a pediatrician, it's, it's my job to make sure that she's healthy today. It's my job to treat her ear infection and her fevers and, and do her well child visits. But more importantly, as a pediatrician, it's my job to make sure that she has the brightest tomorrow possible. Um, I took an oath. I literally took an oath to, to be that protector, to be that healer. Um, and what was happening in our water was, was threatening the tomorrows um, of all of these kids. So I did something that doctors uh, don't usually do, but should do more of. Um, I walked out of my clinic, um, and I stood up at a press conference, like in, a, in our hospital auditorium, where I, I give lectures on like different pediatric topics at a podium similar to this, but it was even higher, and I was, I'm still really short. Um, and I stood up at that press conference um, with the science, um, with the research that our children um, were being poisoned by this water. So after the water switch happened, um, the percentage of kids with elevated lead levels in Flint had doubled. Um, contrary to every trend that was happening in the nation, the state, and even our city, where the lead levels had been coming down. And I did, I did something that I, I wasn't supposed to do. It was an academic no-no to, sh to share my science that wasn't peer-reviewed. So many of you here have published works. Uh, how long does that publication process take? Okay. <laughs> Judging by your laughter, it takes a long time. It takes months and months and months to, to publish work. Um, and our kids in Flint didn't have another day. Um, they didn't have a day to spare. And, and thus, we, we, we had to share this publicly at a press conference. Um, and I felt great after that happened. I'm like, yay, kids are going to be protected. Um, they're going to stop drinking this water. Maybe we'll get some response from government. Um, but just like everyone else in the story, um, from the amazing activist moms to the journalists, pastors, um, different folks that uh, were part of this, um, this story, um, right away I was attacked. Um, I was attacked by the state. Uh, the state said I was wrong. Uh, they said that I was unfortunate. They said that I was causing hysteria. That's my favorite because it was also sexist. Um, and, and, and for a moment, I believed them. I mean, the state has like 50 epidemiologists. Uh, they have all this data um, of, of children's lead levels. Um, and I felt sick. Uh, I felt scared. I had a knot in my stomach that absolutely wouldn't go away. Uh, my heart rate was, was zooming. Um, but I knew my, my science was right. I knew my data was right. And it, it made sense. Like, hey, this water was corroding engine parts. I mean, what, it's common sense that this was going to happen. Um, so we fought back. I fought back with, with more science, with more data, with more evidence. Um, and most, those of us who do kind of public health research and, and spend a lot of time looking at spreadsheets, um, those numbers are people. Uh, and sometimes we forget that. And every single number in my spreadsheets and my data was a kid. 
Uh, it was a kid like Lily. It was a kid that had probably even taken care of in that last year. And that was kind of my inspiration to move forward and to keep fighting. Um, and finally, our science, um, our persistence, our disobedience um, spoke truth to power. And that house of cards um, that the state had been holding up finally fell. Um, and they admitted that there was a problem and, 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 and things started to change. So to this day, like I mentioned, um, to this day in Flint, we are still on filtered and bottled water. So two weeks after my press conference, we switched back to Detroit treated water. However, the 18 months that we were on this untreated corrosive water ate up our pipes. Um, so our pipes are now being replaced. Um, but that takes a long time. There's only two other cities in the country that have replaced their lead pipes, Lansing, Michigan, and Madison, Wisconsin, and it took those cities over a decade. So our pipes are supposed to be replaced by 2020, which is actually the fastest it's ever happened. Um, but until then, people are still on filtered water um, and bottled water. But um, my work is, is, is the kids. Um, from the moment that we realized that we had this widespread lead exposure, um, we had this moral, ethical, professional obligation to do everything we can to make sure that our kids turn out OK. Um, so in, in lead, in the public health world, you're supposed to do primary prevention, right? You're never supposed to expose a population to lead. Uh, we failed at that. So now we are at the point of secondary prevention. What can we do to make sure that we do not see the consequences of this exposure? And we are leaning on that incredible science of, of brain de development, of resilience, um, to buffer the impact of this crisis. And I have the best job in the world now. I get to lead this public health initiative um, to make sure that our, our, our children have everything they need um, to, to, to make sure they turn out OK. So what that means, so that means that for every kid uh, like Lily, raised in a toxic environment, because there are many, or an unraveling community with lots of adversities um, that all take a terrible toll on childhood development. Um, they all have lasting and graded and predictable impacts on child development. Um, there's hope. Um, and sometimes I say that, um, that I'm actually writing prescriptions for hope. Uh, when, when moms come in and ask me, is she going to be OK? It's, it's, it's so much of what we do as, as pediatricians. It's a lot of reassurance. and and hope building. Um, but I don't just use the word hope lightly. Uh, we are doing that through tan tangible, real outcomes. Um, so right now in Flint, um, we are building that resilience through real evidence-based interventions. Um, so we have now doubled the capacity, for example, of our home visiting programs. Things like nurse family partnership, evidence-based interventions that we know improve children's development. Uh, we have um, two brand new child care centers. I was actually at one yesterday. It's an educare center. One of the highest quality uh, early childhood centers that takes care of, uh, of kids zero to five. It's free in Flint. It's all year. It's high quality early education. And we know the robust data on the benefits of early education. Um, and, and that's also been um, supported by Head Start dollars. We have universal preschool in Flint. We're the only city in Michigan to have universal preschool. We have Medicaid expansion uh, because of the water crisis. So um, it has increased the age and the income eligibility um, of Medicaid. Medicaid is awesome, um, and this is even more awesome. It includes something called family supports coordination, which in has home visiting um, to get people connected to resources. Uh, we've put into place parenting support programs, mindfulness programming. So our kids in Flint schools, up to three times a day, they do like yoga and deep breathing and meditation um, to kind of block out the world and the stress and the anxiety. Um, Flint is a place that had no full service grocery stores. Uh, I was talking earlier that our clinic, which takes care of most of the Flint kids, is actually built on the second floor of a farmer's market on purpose to address food insecurity. Um, I used to practice and I would tell my patients, oh, you should eat avocados and kale. And they're like, they just look at me. I'm like, what are you talking about? Where am I going to get that? And how can I afford that? So we made the environmental decision to move our clinic to a place where people can have access to fresh fruits and 
and vegetables. Um, and every kid that comes into our clinic um, gets a prescription printed in our EMR, just like amoxicillin, for um, healthy nutrition that they can fill downstairs in the farmer's market um, that, that is subsidized. Um, we also moved our clinic to where it is because it's across from the central bus stop. Um, of greatest irony in the city that built cars, uh, we have tremendous transportation burdens. Um, so we said, hey, let's be at a place where our patients can get to. Uh, so it's espousing all these public health concepts. Uh, we now have mobile grocery stores, so grocery stores on wheels that go into different areas of Flint uh, that are guided by a nutrition geographer who kind of maps out food deserts. Um, we have a huge expansion of school health services. So before this crisis, we had one school nurse in Flint. That's it. Uh, we now have over 10, which is amazing. Uh, we have school-based health centers um, and other kind of school resources. Uh, behavioral health support. Uh, we have trauma crisis lines, an expansion of trauma-informed care. Um, and I think one of the biggest medications that I can prescribe or that should be prescribed for the cities is we actually now have jobs in Flint. Uh, so going back to that economic history, uh, one of the most important things we can do for kids is to lift families out of poverty. Uh, so we have jobs in early childhood. Um, we have nurse aides and bus drivers and school nurses and um, different, uh, there's a plant that's coming in that's using our recycled water bottles to make auto parts. It's pretty amazing. Um, and uh, well, something I'm most excited about is that we have a huge expansion of early literacy programs. Uh, I think we all know the benefits of early literacy. Um, but in places like Flint, in places in extreme poverty, there's about one book for every 300 kids. And you've probably heard this research. By the time a child reaches the age of three, they've heard 30 million less words, and they're lower quality words. By the time that they're 18 months of age, you already see evidence of that achievement gap. And by the time they reach kindergarten, it is almost too late. Um, so we have taken a deep dive in early literacy. Right now in Flint, every kid gets a book mailed to them every single month from the age of zero to five. Uh, we've hugely expanded something called Reach Out and Read, which is a clinic-based, evidence-based literacy program. Went from one clinic, our clinic, to now about 10 clinics in Flint. Uh, we have a newborn literacy program. When babies are actually born at the hospital, they get a literacy bundle um, with development tools and, and early intervention support. Uh, so books, I think, are possibly the strongest medicines for our kids' brains. Um, so all of this work is, is, um, is guided um, by one of my favorite quotes. So um, an abolitionist, Frederick, Frederick Douglass, uh, so hopefully you know him. He was kind of reborn last year around this time, if you remember that. Um, so 150 years ago, um, he said, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Um, and anybody who, um, you know, has anybody with any experience in public health and even in medicine, uh, you go to an adult floor and you see these, you know, like a long laundry list of chronic diseases from diabetes and obesity and cardiac disease. To fix those problems, you need to time travel back into their childhood. Um, it is so much easier to build strong children um, than to repair broken men. So in a city that is known for building strong cars, uh, we are now building, um, as strong kids. Really, the whole community has come together uh, to focus on our kids. Um, but I also want to share with you that Flint um, is a story about how each of us, wherever we are, whoever we are, whatever we do, um, has the power to fix things. Um, whether um, we've been in this country for centuries uh, or we um, came here, as my family did, uh, as immigrants. Um, one of my other favorite quotes is, is from MLK. Uh, we, have, we may have all come here on different ships, um, but we're all in the same boat. Uh, we all need to work together uh, to create a better, a safer world, a place where all children um, can develop without obstacles, without barriers, with great schools, with safe neighborhoods, with healthy food, with clean air and clean water. Um, but we can't do this alone. Um, we need all of us to do this together. And, and we, need, we need your voice. Uh, we need your strength to make this happen. Uh, we especially need the respected, incredible voice of public health, of science, of medicine, um, to get out of their classrooms, to get out of their clinics, to get out of their labs, um, and to use their voices uh, to safeguard their communities in partnership with communities, hand in hand with communities, um, uh, to fight for injustices no matter where 
where they are and, and to be those public health advocates. Because someday, uh, and this is, this is kind of going to the students, um, you will be faced with an important uh, choice and uh, an important decision. And the issue may not be as momentous as the poisoning of a town, but like I said earlier, there are, there are flints everywhere. There are injustices everywhere. Um, and as MLK said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And you, uh, when you are faced with this important decision, can choose to stay silent. Uh, and that is the easiest choice, probably. And it will probably be the easiest choice for you, socially, economically, politically, academically. Um, and trust me, it is hard um, to raise your voice. It is scary. Um, you stop eating. There's a knot in your stomach. That, like I said, that won't go away. Um, you stop sleeping. Um, it is not easy. However, years and years um, from now, you're, you're not going to think back and say, I wish I stayed silent. You will say, I hope you will say, I am proud that I raised my voice and I stood up for what was right. And there is a lot that you can stand up for these days. Uh, your voice is needed on so many fronts. Uh, the credibility of science is under attack, from vaccines to climate change. Uh, safeguards for our most vulnerable are being threatened. So many uh, support programs like WIC and Medicaid. Uh, regulations and public health agencies like the EPA are, are currently being dismantled. Uh, we can, we will, it's the perfect recipe for more flints to come. Healthcare access uh, is continually being threatened. The ACA is, wants to be repealed every day. Uh, our dreamers need you. Uh, there's issues of mass incarceration in every city, uh, gun control right now. Uh, there are many, many public health issues that need your voice and your activism. They need you to stand up. Um, we all need you. And if we do not raise our collective voices, our values, uh, people's lives uh, and livelihoods, and really what's left of this American promise um, is at risk. So in Flint, we have learned um, that we can help our children heal and help them become resilient. Um, but we have also learned that just as a, a child can heal, so can a family, uh, so can a city, so can a community, so can a neighborhood, um, and so can a country. A country can endure trauma, and neglect and injustice and become a place where people are cared for, where democracy and equality and opportunity are once again encouraged and advanced. But this needs to be all of our work. You guys with me? You guys in this work? Yeah? All right. Um, awesome. Thank you. That is all I have. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm going to give uh, one shameless plug. Oh, that's thank you. My th that's my thank you slide. Um, so uh, if any of this was interesting at all, um, I have added to my CV the list of author. Uh, so I have a book coming out in a couple months where I take a deeper dive into um, a lot of these issues. It's, it's a lot about the Flint story. It's about public health history. I have a chapter called Miasma. My John Snow is one of my heroes. I talk about some strong, badass women in the field. Um, it's also um, about my immigrant roots and my social justice history. Uh, so feel free to uh, check that out if you're interested. And I am so excited about the Q&A. Thank you. Hey, Mr. So thank you so much, Dr. Anna Tisha, for taking some of your precious time to come and visit and speak to us at Brown. I think it really spoke to the calls earlier to address, acknowledge, and address issues of racism and injustice, not only in Flint, but everywhere. We're now going to move into the question and answer portion of the event. And following the first question, we invite audience members to use the microphones that were set up by our lovely media staff members uh, to ask their questions to Dr. Anna Tisha. Awesome. And, and I'm going to kick off. Great. I get the great honor of kicking off the first awesome. question. So as we mentioned before, the lead crisis has disproportionately affected some communities more than others, and these are typically communities of color, and more particular, black and brown people. What can public health students and scientists do to ensure that the most marginalized voices are the ones that are centered when discussing these issues? And maybe you can speak to a little bit more about how you do that in your work as well. Absolutely. 
So Flint is this perfect case of environmental injustice. So there's been many kind of reports and investigations and uh, deep dives into what happened. Uh, one by the uh, Michigan Civil Rights Commission, uh, which very clearly articulated that this was a case of environmental injustice. It would not have happened in a community uh, that was whiter or, or was richer. Uh, so since then, there's been a lot of discussions about kind of what, where we need to go and, and what we need to do next. Um, so I started, I had a very kind of non-traditional path to kind of where I am. Uh, I went to college as, an, as a tree-hugging environmentalist. Uh, I was an environmental science major, kind of created my own discipline in environmental health. Um, but I took classes over 20 years ago in environmental injustice uh, by one of the leaders in this field, a guy named Professor Bunyan Bryant, who was a Flint native, actually. And it was his work and experiences in Flint that guided uh, his, his teachings. Um, he actually filed a lawsuit 25 years ago against the EPA about a, a lead uh, burning plant in Flint that was placed in an African American neighborhood. And in the last week of Obama's office, that, that lawsuit was finally settled and they did say yes, this was a case of environmental injustice. So 20 years ago, I was learning about what environmental injustice was that you know, you know, study after study, disproportionately poor and brown, brown people continue to suffer um, from the burdens of environmental uh, pollution. Um, so unfortunately, uh, you know, 30 years after the discipline was born, we continue to have the same issues. Um, so I think what, what, you know, when one of the central tenets of the environmental justice doctrine of that movement is that people need to have a voice at the table. And I think Flint is probably the most extreme example of people's voice being dismissed and silenced and ridiculed in an extreme way. Democracy was taken away. Flint literally had no elected accountable folks. The emergency manager testified at Congress, and one of the congressional folks asked, why, didn't you, like, why, why weren't you listening to people? He said, I didn't have to. I didn't have to. I didn't have to have a town hall meeting. I didn't have to have, listen to people. Democracy is messy, but it is necessary. The voice of people um, affected need to be part of solutions, need to be at the table when these decisions are made. When a decision is made to switch a water source, to build a pipeline, to, do, to build a complex, the voice of community needs to be at the table. Uh, so for those of us to, you know, who are in this discipline, um, I think what we can do is to, to continue to partner with our communities and in real partnership, uh, not let me tell you what to do, but let me listen to you. Let me let, come, to our, you know, come to our table and tell me what's, what's going on. Uh, in our work, we are guided and informed um, by, by families, by, by community as much as possible. We actually have a parent partner group where it's actually parents who are advising us on, on what we do for, for all of our work. And we also have a youth advisory council. Kids, kids are, we've learned over the last few weeks how, how strong and brilliant kids are. Uh, we have Flint kids who are also telling us what we should be doing rather than the other way around. Um, but I think central to that is having voices at the table. Could you say a word about the uh, state of the criminal prosecution against those responsible. I think the city manager who switched the water then went to the Detroit uh, schools, schools mm -hmm. uh, which was a disaster. What happened to him? Sure, so the question is about what happened to the criminal charges in Flint. So there's been about 18 criminal charges, um, including some homicide charges. So I talked a lot about the lead crisis. Lead was not the only problem in our water crisis. We also had the largest outbreak of Legionnaire's disease. Legionnaire's disease is an opportunistic pathogen that comes from water. Um, so the corrosive water ate up the iron pipes. When the iron was in the water, it ate up the chlorine, which is important, it's a disinfectant. And that created a perfect milieu for the, for the overgrowth of, of things like Legionella. 12 people died. There was an uptick of overall pneumonia mortality in Flint as well. So many folks have also been charged with homicide. Uh, so the people that have been charged, criminally charged, and those, uh, it's all ongoing. Just actually this week there was, um, so the head of our state health department was, has been criminally charged. His hearings were this week. Uh, the chief medical officer for the state. People in our CLIP program, the Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Program. Uh, but the majority of the charges and the culpability are in our Office of Drinking Water at the state. Uh, under the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality. 
uh, the, you know, there's blame at many levels of government, but, but the majority of blame is on their feet. They're the ones that were supposed to put the corrosion control in, but didn't. They're the ones that were in, when they were even told by EPA to do it, didn't do it. Uh, the EPA is also at fault. Uh, the EPA um, inspector general uh, had an investigation, wrote a report that the EPA should have acted seven months sooner. Uh, they silenced a whistleblower. They didn't alert the public. Uh, there's some really damning emails. One woman said, uh, Flint is not a, not a city worth going out on a limb for. Uh, so there's lots of culpability. There's about 300 lawsuits against the state. Uh, so it's going to take a long time for this to get sorted out. The accountability is important. Um, so you can almost think of it like a, like a truth and reconciliation process. People want to know what happened. They need to, people to be charged and held accountable um, so that they can really kind of go on that long path towards recovery. It's also really important to know so it doesn't happen again. This cannot happen again. Um, and, and you know we fail to learn from our mistakes. Flint is by far not the first time that we have had a lead and water crisis. Uh, DC had a lead and water crisis a, a decade ago, and, and Mark Edwards, this heroic uh, water engineer from Virginia, exposed that, and he's the one that brought us the water science here. Um, but if anybody wants some great bedtime reading, there's a book called The Great Lead Water Pipe Disaster. It is about 150 years of lead and water disasters um, all over uh, the, the country. Um, so who knows what the word um, uh, lead comes from? What does it come from? The, the Latin derivation. Elemental symbol of lead, chemistry. Where's my PB? Okay, so lead comes from plumbum, okay, which means plumbing, okay? So the Romans actually built their aqueducts out of lead plumbing. So lead has actually always meant plumbing. Like, I didn't even know it. Like, there was lead or plumbing for this. Um, so there's a law, and many people hypothesize the demise of the Romans is because they used lead and plumbing, but they also put it in food into crazy things with it. So uh, we've known about kind of the evilness of lead for a long time, but we've also known about its effects in, in water for a long time. Yet we have lacked the political will to really do anything about it. I uh, just want to give my own personal thanks, Mona. We, we've been talking about this now for quite a while. But I have a question I shared with you uh, before the, your talk, but I wanted to make sure that the rest of the audience knew that another chapter <clears throat> in this environmental injustice is about to um, be written in our state next year's state budget. There's an item, and the hearing is on Wednesday, at the rise, uh, DCYF, our Children's Protection Program, is asking to be relieved from the requirement that foster homes be lead safe. Because it's, I won't, I I won't put words, I, can't it. I won't put words in their mouth, but, um, so I'm gonna be testifying, and I was curious, I only had two minutes, and you were whispering in my ear, what would, what would you tell me to say? Uh, I don't think I need to tell you anything. I think you know this 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 topic uh, better than I do. Um, so all, all of this is preventable. We we know what to do to protect children from le from lead poisoning, um, and we even know the economic benefit. So just uh, late last year, uh, Pew and R RWJ released this really great updated report on the economic benefit of of lead elimination. Um, and isn't that what kind of what policymakers like to hear is the dollar signs? So it would save our nation about $80 billion a year um, to eliminate lead exposure. A year. Uh, decreased, uh, you know, uh, special education costs, criminal justice costs, healthcare costs, behavioral healthcare costs, decreased economic productivity. The science is there. The science is there. So, so if anything, maybe, you know, given the economic pitch, um, that it saves money. But the problem is um, the, the savings of dollars is in different buckets. It's not in the same buckets that the people invest in. And you often don't see those savings for uh, decades, which is after the lifespan of that legislator. Um, but I think um, if not for the moral reason, I would, I would give them the financial reason. I think my saddest day in Flint was when I found out that there was um, a foster home, which is across the hospital, that takes care of 
um, uh, kids who are neglected and abused, um, adolescents, um, that their water lead level came back at 5,000 parts per billion. I think that was my lowest day. So uh, what do you guys know about water lead level? So what is the action level for lead in water? Anybody know? 15 parts per billion is the EPA action level for lead in water. Is that a health-based standard? No. no, it's gibberish. It's like what feasibility of water utilities can do. Uh, the World Health Organization's action level for lead in water is 10. Um, the FDA's action level for lead and water for bottled water is actually five parts per billion. The American Academy of Pediatrics says that the lead and water level for daycares and childcare facilities should be one. So there's no safe level of lead, so it, it should be nothing. Um, so we had lead levels in water all over the place, but it was my lowest day when um, we found out that a home, the Home for Foster Kids had a lead level of 5,000 parts per billion. These are children that have already every adversity in the world, and then we're going to give them more. Good luck. You can call me. Let me know. Okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to first thank you. That was incredible, and, and thank you so much for your time today. Um, so the secondary prevention measures you mentioned uh, sound amazing, and amazing. I am so impressed it's with awesome. everything from the universal preschool to the Medicare expansion. And I'm just curious on how uh, these are occurring. Like, is it going through local government? Are people doing it outside of government? And especially just with, um, I feel like today it's so easy to become disillusioned by like federal policy and federal levels. And so maybe if we can, uh, or if you see looking at like other ways, like going through uh, local or even like sure. outside. Uh, making changes that way. Great. Yeah. So her awesome question was about how are you doing all this secondary prevention work? Uh, you know, who's doing them and how is it being done? I thought you were going to ask me how, how are they funded, but I'll get to that too. Um, so um, it is a blend of everything. So uh, we have uh, federal Head Start dollars that are helping with the preschool slots. We have federal CMS support for the Medicaid expansion. We have state um, dollars for some of the preschool slots. Um, but by and large, a lot of this is with the support of philanthropy and, and nonprofit organizations. Um, so it is a mix of everything. So right, right after the crisis um, and right after it became kind of national news, um, we were flooded with water bottles. Everybody from all over the America, like it was so heartwarming, like the, the generosity of the nation, just like we see in so many disasters. Like we, we were getting water bottles from like everywhere. And there was, and it was finally something the feds were paying for. Like it like finally became an emergency and like we didn't need water bottles. We had so many water bottles it was being stored at an Air Force base nearby. Um, so a group of us got together and said, hey, like, you know, the water is eventually going to get better. But, but what about like five years from now and six years from now? We need to create um, a tomorrow fund for our kids. So um, we created uh, something called the Flint Child Health and Development Fund, which is funding the home visiting programs and the early literacy and the mindfulness and the nutrition education. Um, so we've been able to raise about $20 million. Um, my book, uh, the portion of the proceeds go to that fund. Uh, so uh, it's been an awesome way to invest in the tomorrow of these children. Um, but a lot of other kind of philanthropy has been helping. Uh, the things that are funded by state and federal government, a lot of those things expire in a couple years. Um, so part of my ongoing advocacy is to make sure that we have those things in place for years, if not decades to come, because those of us who work in lead know that the consequences will last years, if not decades, if not generations. So we need that ongoing advocacy. And the stuff we are doing is like not rocket science. Like this is, this is what all kids need. Like this is not just what Flint kids need. Every single kid needs these evidence-based development promoting interventions. And that's what we hope to share. So we are building this registry in Flint that's not gonna tell you the consequences of lead poisoning because we know those consequences. What we hope to share with the nation is our best practices. That hey, we had this tragedy, but we were able to do bing, 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 and this is how our, these are how our kids turn out. So we hope to be really kind of positive and proactive and to share those, those with the nation. Hi, thank you so much for coming. Um, your talk was absolutely wonderful. Um, so going um, actually off of her question, so those children who are above five years old that have irreversible effects from lead, what 
programs, if any, do you have in place for them? Sure, we have a lot of things for older. I mean, our focus is that prenatal, the preschool window, because of brain plasticity and you know, kind of what we learned. But but there's things in place for all kids. So Medicaid is available for all those kids. School nurses, the mindfulness, the trauma informed care. Um, and then I get up, people yell at me all the time at, at you know different events and fun like. What about seniors? I mean, like lead affects everybody, you know, hypertension, gout, early dementia. So this thing's in place for, for really across the lifespan, but the focus really is the most critical uh, under five, under six, because that's when we know lead has the greatest damage. Um, people also often yell at me, like, what about the pets? So um, like in many environmental health disasters, it's often the animals that are the first to get, show signs of anything. And people are like, you know, it was my dog who started seizing and got sick. Like, uh, because also they, for water, they gave them water out of maybe like a laundry tub or like a hose. And the, the fixtures for those things have different lead parts because it's not for potable water. So their animals were the first to get sick. So MSU actually has a vet school. So they had animal clinics and did lead testing and, and also published work. Uh, parallel to ours that showed an increase in the blood levels of animals during this crisis. So we care for all. <laughs> Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I, I just, I've been sitting in the back just so grateful to hear all the wonderful things that are coming out of this because so many times we focus on the, um, the tragedy. But I just had a quick question about um, if you could um, expound on the nutrition education. Um, component of your work that you were um, talking about in terms of, you know, maybe partnerships um, with the public schools and getting the students to be um, more in, in, in tune with nature and science and, and the fact that you're writing prescriptions for farmers markets for them to look at um, their nutrition and um, seeing it as a part of science and their health. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. So it was a great question about kind of nutrition and how do you work with maybe students um, to get them involved in uh, and nutrition and, uh, and the science of it. Uh, so it, our work is kind of multifaceted as a community. Uh, we have something in Flint that existed before the water crisis called Edible, Edible Flint, which is all about kind of urban farming. Uh, and they used to even do kind of lead testing of soil because that was an issue before and, and how to grow soil pro or grow food properly. Uh, we have a lot of hoop houses. We uh, This daycare center that I was at yesterday, they're putting a hoop house there so that these little, you know, two-year-olds can like grow their food and they can they can cook it there uh, with snap snap dollars snap ad dollars they've been able to um, improve school lunches especially at the peak of this crisis when we knew kids needed higher um, calcium iron and vitamin c in their diets to limit ongoing absorption so there's been a lot of efforts with nutrition so um, the the initiative that i direct this pediatric public health initiative has lots of teams of work, and we have actually one team that's just focused on nutrition. Uh, nutrition is a forever solution. Not only do all children need great food for their brains to grow, but in, in lead exposure, it's, it's especially important. Um, for ongoing exposure, it's important to be fully loaded in certain nutrients to limit that exposure. But um, lead eventually gets stored in your bones, and then where it can kind of come out for decades. Uh, during periods of like stress or pregnancy or poor nutrition. And the only way to really limit that is to always be fully loaded on great nutrition. Um, so it's a, it's a forever kind of treatment to this crisis. Um, so we, I have a, an RD, PhD, MPH. She's a public health nutritionist on my team. She's awesome, um, who helps kind of lead a lot of these community interventions that also include the mobile grocery store, but urban farming initiatives, uh, school education. We have a program that we just launched called Flint Kids Cook, uh, where we actually teach kids how to cook. Like it's, it's not enough to just give them the subsidies and the incentives and the, the free food. It's important to give them the skills. And, and we realize a lot of these kids like don't have aprons or they don't have the cutting boards. So we were, given, we were providing that stuff too. So lots of work. I have a really quick question. Um, this, this case is so hopeful, I think, in part because it deals with public infrastructure, of education, um, and of water. Um, so you mentioned earlier that you had learned about environmental justice um, in a, in a, you know, from, from sort of corporate polluters. And um, that's sort of another familiar story in environmental justice, but it doesn't always end so hopefully um, when the culprits are private industries. 
So I think about Louisiana's chemical corridor, um, the state of Alabama where I come from, um, those are sort of the people that um, are often um, uh, those who are causing a lot of environmental crisis. Right, you don't expect the enemy to be government, you expect it to be private. Right, yeah. so I'm wondering um, what kind of knock-on effects or dialogues are happening um, between what's happened in Flint and those who ha are fighting these really long battles in yeah. courts or in public against yeah. corporate polluters in Michigan or elsewhere? Yeah, so, you know, um, as terrible as Flint is, um, it really is quite a success story. Like, uh, there's so many people who have been fighting these battles for years, if not decades. Um, so I, I recently got to know Lewis Gibbs, who was the champion of Love Canal. And we w had this um, session, a small group, where we were going through all these case studies of environmental injustices that had been going on for years and years and years, and nobody is paying attention. Um, so I, I, I don't know what the secret of our success was, um, or, you know, or how we can make sure that people pay attention sooner. Uh, I think Flint was a constellation of things with our democracy issues and the race issues and the brown water issues and uh, there was a lot of things that kind of, but it was still too long, it took 18 months, like 18 months that people were drinking this brown water and nobody did anything. Um, we have a similar issue in the west side of Michigan where is a, a shoe company, um, the tannery has uh, polluted the, the drinking water. Um, and you know, and that also took a long time to disclose. Uh, so I mean, I don't have a great answer there, but there's 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 fights on many different fronts. Um, and I think before this, I was I've always been like I wasn't naive, but I'm I'm a believer in government. Like I'm a believer that that government is charged to protect our public health uh, with air, clean air, and clean water. Uh, and, and on, like, you know, my evil was always industry. <laughs> in Michigan, we have Dow Chemical. We have all the, we, um, one of the biggest environmental crimes or disasters in Michigan was this PBB disaster where uh, feed, uh, animal feed was replaced by a flame retardant. And to this day, generations later, and there's a registry for this, people are still contaminated and there's like endocrine disruption. Uh, so, you know, that was always in my mindset what, what evil was, but it's, it's, I think we have to open our eyes to, to more than that. I just want to say I'm a physician. Um, I actually worked on the PCB scandal. Oh. Scandal in my lab. Dr. Titi's lab in MSU. Oh, my gosh. Uh, and I can see attention to that. Oh, I'm going to give you a hug later. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so, um, there is a very interesting book on birth by the night. Yes. Where we actually had to tell mothers not to have kids. Yeah, oh, no, yeah. Yeah. So it's amazing. There's some great recent articles, too. So uh, the PBB registry is now taken over by a group in Emory, and they're seeing that, like, you know, grandchildren have all these thyroid disruption, disruption um, and endocrine mimicry issues because of this exposure, um, you know, decades ago. It's very interesting. So there's time for one more question, and then we will we welcome everybody to the reception Yay. outside in the lobby afterwards. So you can also ask some questions or get hugs that you weren't able to get um, during the um, So yeah. you've done some great work in Flint. I'm wondering if you found that any of these surrounding communities have kind of picked up on the best practices that you guys have been able to offer, and if it any you're seeing any kind of residual Absolutely. geographic effects. Absolutely, you're so cute. I love you, baby. <laughs> Peter Christians, I love you. So. Um, so yeah, so like I, you know, Flint is a disaster, but there have been incredible ripple effects throughout the nation. Um, so by and large, like medicine and public health, like lead was a problem of yesterday. Like what, what? lead's still a problem? So I think Flint has really kind of awoken the national consciousness that lead is a problem of today and lead is a problem of tomorrow. So um, because of Flint, so many more communities have enacted laws, for example, for universal screening of children, um, for replacement of lead pipes. Milwaukee, just two weeks ago, uh, the Governor Walker signed legislation to replace their lead pipes. Uh, so, I mean, I can go on and on and on about things that have happened because of Flint. Schools are testing uh, all over the country from New York, New Jersey, New York, Baltimore, and finding lead. My, my own kids' school actually was supposed to be at a meeting this morning. Uh, like suburbia tested and found lead in water because it's there, because it's in our fixtures, it's everywhere. Um, so there's been some really great ripple effects. Um, 
led, unfortunately, I and mean, we talked about this earlier, public health response is so reactive. Like, it shouldn't be this way. We shouldn't have to have a disaster to do something about it. Um, but the CDC, their lead poisoning prevention program, they were essentially zeroed out in 2012. Um, they had, because, oh, we fixed it. We got rid of lead from paint and, and you know, gas. It's not a problem anymore. Uh, in 2014, they got a little bit more, they, they went back to 15 million, but it used to be 30 million. Uh, but because of Flint, they've gotten a little more resources. Um, so there have been, you know, some positive ripple effects, but we have a long way to go in terms of uh, public health protection, children's mm -hmm. protection, children's health protection, uh, poverty mitigation. Like, there's some big, big, buckets of areas that we still need to address. Thank you.